building an army for a war game, whether it's Warhammer or a historical game or some other fantasy game, can be overwhelming, confusing, and not just a little intimidating. In this video, I'm going to share with you my process for figuring out what kind of army I want to collect for the game that I'm going to play. This is just one way of doing it. Other people are going to have different thoughts. You yourself might develop your own thoughts, or you may have your own thoughts already. Feel free to share those in the comments below, but here's how I approach it. Step one, research. It's a little dangerous, for reasons I'll go into later, to start with the research step, but I, in my opinion, and I think in, in some people's views, this is the most important component of choosing your army, and that is to learn about the armies available to you. In my opinion, and in this model with research at the front, cool is as cool does. And I say it that way because a lot of times when we're choosing an army for a game, our compulsion and, and some advice out there, a lot of advice out there, is to choose the army that looks cool to you. Why would you do that? Well, I mean, really good reasons. I mean, if they look cool, then you'll be able to sort of imagine yourself as part of that army because you want to be cool. And if it looks cool to you, then when you're building them and painting them, that will be an enjoyable process. So the look of an army, because a, a war game is such a physical hobby, the look of the army is really important, and yet, beauty is on the inside. The more you research an army, the more you find you might like that army from a kind of intellectual viewpoint. An army might not look as cool as a different army, but if they've got an intriguing backstory or a noble cause or a really just cool and evil cause that you think is really fun, whatever their backstory, whatever their lore, that's the thing you're actually going to connect with. So my first step when choosing an army is to not look at the miniatures yet. Instead, I, I step back and I do the research about the, the army and the campaigns that they went on and so on. It doesn't matter whether it's historical, real-world stuff or whether it's fictional, science fiction, or fantasy. I hunt down the backstory of that army and I read up on them. If there are some really interesting lead characters, I learn about them. If there are some key campaigns or key battles that they fought or key tactics that they used, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for to get me interested enough in an army to want to play them on the table. This usually reveals a lot of interesting details about what you're going to need to look for in miniatures as well. I, I learned the hard way from my Roman and Egyptian armies that the word nation plus the word army doesn't accurately describe a group of people preparing for a war. Uh, it seems obvious to me now, but if somebody had asked me, for instance, to collect a U.S. army, well, I'd have to ask for more detail. Am I collecting a U.S. army from the 1770s, from the 1800s, from the late 1800s, 1910, 1950, and so on? I never quite understood also the obsession with generals that is kind of common among mini wargamers. But now that I play, I get it. The general name plus army is a pretty accurate way to describe exactly the assemblage of people that got together that one time to go get themselves killed while trying to kill other people doing the same thing. If you told me to build a Napoleonic army, for instance, then I understand not to buy books about the Gallic Wars of the 50s BCE because I know that Napoleon was campaigning in the 1800s CE. Even in Warhammer or any fictional universe, you can't really just say you're going to build like a space marine army because there are, after all, different chapters and different legions depending on whether you're playing in the Horus Heresy or the 40,000. So before you can look at army miniatures, you need to understand the life and times of the army you're thinking about playing. I figure the worst case scenario is that you learn a bunch of history, either real world or fictional, about something that's entertaining and, and that there are worse things to do with your afternoon. So don't be afraid of the research. Dive in, learn about the army, settle on one or two prospective things that you might want to collect through research, and then proceed to step 
Two, find miniatures. I, again, I debated whether this should be first or second because there is a pragmatic thing to consider here, and that is once you've decided on an army, do you know for sure there are miniatures to represent that army? And that can be kind of complicated. To be fair, there's a lot of miniatures out there, and probably if you settle on, if, if you could find the thing to do the research on on the internet, there's probably a set of miniatures out there that at least approximate the army that you have now fallen in love with through your research. There are exceptions, of course, uh, not the least of which is that it's all imaginary. I mean, you can buy miniatures and then make up lore for any army to justify its existence. In other words, you can put anything on a table and justify why it would be fighting some other toy on the same table. They could be glass beads, and the others could be Napoleonic soldiers. Why are glass beads fighting Napoleonic soldiers? Obviously because a reality distortion field has descended upon the battlefield. I mean, it just doesn't matter. You can play any rules with any miniatures, so it doesn't literally matter how much you research, how much you decide what miniature you want to put on a table. If you're just trying to play a game, anything will do. But I'm assuming that you, like many wargamers, are partly into the game for the toys. And so you want your miniatures to reflect something that you have in mind. Probably something that you've been researching, according to my first step of researching the lore or the history of your army. Something to represent that. It may or may not be exactly that, but it might be inspired by that. And sometimes you do have to be a little bit loose in your interpretation. When I decided that I wanted to build a Roman army and an Egyptian army and have them fight each other, even though in history they didn't actually fight as much as you might imagine them being such in such close approximation to one another, uh, like physically, geographically, but I, I wanted them to fight, and, and so I was looking for an imperial Roman army, and for the life of me I could not find mounted soldiers for Imperial Rome. I'm sure they exist, but where I live, I could not find any. I had to resort to using Carthaginians, which doesn't really match my army, but it was close enough. And my Egyptian army, woefully, is out of date. I mean, it's it's literally a, a Ramses II army from, well, obviously, Ramses, Pharaonic, Egypt, uh, rather than Ptolemaic. Egypt, which would have been much more appropriate for Imperial Rome, but you know what? They, when you look at them, they look maybe cartoonishly, but I mean, they look Egyptian. You think, yep, that's that's Egypt, and and going up against Imperial Rome, it all just kind of works. It, admittedly, the presence of a chariot is a little bit over the top, but I mean, it still kind of works. It's it it it, it works in the sense that you want classic. Things that you think of as Egypt and classic things that you think of as Rome going up against each other on a battlefield. It's not accurate. I acknowledge that, but I have fun with it. And sometimes that's what you have to do. You've done your research. You're looking for the miniatures. Maybe you find exactly what you want. Maybe you can't find exactly you, what you want. Maybe you have to do some conversions. You have to help your models along a little bit. Or maybe you just have to throw your hands up in the air and decide that what you have is good enough. I've had similar issues with my space marines for Warhammer 40,000 and Horus Heresy. The my, my deep dark secret is that I've I, I purchased Horus Heresy space marines because I like the look of Mark VI armor. So I bought Horus Heresy. I play Horus Heresy, but when I want to play 40,000 or Kill Team or whatever, I'm still using my Horus Heresy Marines. Is that exactly correct? No, not really. I mean, probably not. Although within the lore, there's an allowance for Space Marines that maybe got caught in the warp for a, a millennia and then popped out on the other side and just went right back into fighting. It totally works. What works a little bit less, to be fair, is when I use my Adeptus Mechanicus 40,000 army in my Horus Heresy games, adapting them for Liber Mechanicum. Totally wrong. It's the wrong set of models. Do I care? No, I don't. Step three, research tactics and war gear. This may seem redundant. I mean, after all, you've already done your research. You've researched the history or the lore of your army. You feel like you know them pretty well. You've even gone out and purchased miniatures. What more could you need to know about this army? Well, you need to know specifically what the rules 
rules of your chosen game, whatever that may be, makes available to your specific army. In some rule books, that's all included. You have the rules of the game, and maybe in the back of the book or the front of the book, there's a section on how to build an army or a squad or a troop, kill team, a strike force, whatever you call it. And it also tells you what kind of superpowers and weaponry and uh, strategies are available for that group. And it's often different depending on the kind of army that you are building. So for instance, suppose you're playing a war game set in the American Revolution. One side are the colonists, and the other side is the British Empire. You could imagine that maybe the colonists wouldn't have all the latest and greatest weaponry. Uh, they've been in the colonies for several years, maybe they haven't been getting shipments of all the latest technology, while the British soldiers would have really powerful weaponry and a lot of it, almost endless resources. You could imagine that the, um, the colonist soldiers would have available to them several guerrilla tactics, like maybe they get benefits to their roles if they are not in a form and instead spread out across the battlefield and attack from all angles, while the British troops might get bonuses to their dice rolls when they stay in tight formation, because that's what the British would have been doing at the time. So each army would play differently, even though in real life they are literally just plastic soldiers. There's nothing really different from the colonist miniature compared to the British miniature. They're both equally valuable, they're both the same kind of plastic, they've been painted a li little bit differently, and maybe their rifles even look the same, but according to the rules, the American rifle doesn't shoot as far as the more advanced British rifle. Disclaimer, I don't know anything about rifles, especially from the 1770s, so this is all just made up stuff from a rule set that I don't even have. I'm just making up rules. But let's assume that that was the case, then you would see how miniatures are expressed differently in different rules and you get similar kinds of limitations or variations uh, between, say, Horus Heresy Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000, or Warhammer 40,000 and Kill Team. The same little plastic gun might damage someone on a 4-up in one game, and yet only damage people on a 5-up in another game. It's the same miniature, it's just a different set of rules being applied to that miniature so that it balances out more or less, as, in, as much as anything balances, uh, in, in that specific game. Now, some rule books, some game systems, have completely separate rule books just for your armies. I'm thinking specifically of Games Workshop products here, but it probably happens elsewhere as well. You do have a separate book for each Space Marine chapter, or you have a separate book for your Legionis Astartes versus your Traitor Legions, and then a, yet a separate book for your Mechanicum, and so on. You also see this in Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game, where you have a, a separate army book for the armies uh, that appear in The Hobbit rather than The Lord of the Rings. My point is that you need to know your game system well enough to know where to find the data required to play each miniature. And if I'm playing something like Rogue Stars from Osprey Games or Broken Legion, then I just need to turn to the back of the book and look up the different kinds of soldiers and then decide for myself which of my toy soldiers I want to use to represent a specific archetype from the book. So for instance, in Osprey Games Black Ops, there's a militia army I could build, and one of the types of soldiers in a militia army is a militia soldier. And a militia soldier might have an accuracy rating of 5, and a close combat rating of 5 seems pretty good. But then there's a militia ace who has an accuracy of 4 and a close combat of 4, but has a bunch of other attributes as well. So I have to decide which of my toy soldiers is going to be the militia soldier, and which one of them is going to be the militia ace, and which one will be the militia heavy and so on. On a practical level, this also might mean that you need to learn a little bit about the war gear is common to your to the time period of your war game. If you don't know that much about, I don't know, Imperial Roman weapons, you don't know the difference between a Gladius or a Pugio, then you may need to look that up. I mean, the, a book might might explain it to you, like your your 
your war game rule book, it may detail that for you, but it may not. Whether it's historical or fiction, sometimes the rules writers just assume you've done enough research to understand the difference between a, I don't know, a galvanic rifle and an arc rifle. And if you don't, if you didn't get to that section in your research, then you might have to go back and look that up. I have yet to encounter a box of miniatures. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, I'm just saying I haven't bought a box of miniatures that spells out what each weapon is called and how to identify them. So I've had to do quite a bit of research and a lot of learning about both real weapons and imaginary weapons, which, I mean, technically I don't actually care about. I'm not going to use these things in real life. I couldn't care less about knowing the classifications and the capabilities of all of these different things. I know some people are really into that. I'm not, but I do need to know them at least so that I know how many dice to roll or, or what I need to roll on a dice in order to successfully hit my target in the game. Steps four and five are kind of obvious, I guess. Uh, Four is build your army, like physically build the army, glue the plastic pieces together, and put them on bases. So now you know everything about your army, truly. You know the rules, you know what options you have, and this is important. This is an important sort of interplay between your rules and your modeling. And it's something that I don't really see that many people talking about. Sometimes you'll hear about things like, oh, you have different loadouts to choose from. And what that means is that now that you know what weapons are available to you and what those weapons, for instance, cost in terms of game points, then you have to decide, you have to sit down at your modeling table and decide how many soldiers are going to have a gladius and how many of them are going to have a pilum. And and maybe one costs more than the other in terms, again, of game points. Not not money, but if a gladius only costs, uh, I don't know, two game points per soldier to have a gladius, but the pilum costs four game points, well, can you afford to have lots and lots of pila soldiers? I don't know. So you kind of have to balance that out depending on how you want to build your army and what you can kind of afford in in what the game allows. Building the army can be something where you have to keep in mind what you're building towards. If you're trying to build a uh, an imperial roman legion that consists half of gladius and half of pilum pila whatever then you have to know that before you start gluing things together in warhammer 10th edition there are no points but there are points but all the weapons are included so you don't really have to think about that so much in terms of game points but you still have to think about that tactically because you might know that you want most of your little soldiers to have bolter guns but you do want one unit of them to have a bunch of flamers. So you need to know that because you're about to glue either an arm holding a bolt gun onto a space marine or a flamer, and you need to know how many of each you need. There's more to building these things than just sitting down and gluing the parts together because there are almost always a bunch of options that you need to make intelligent choices about so that when you put them on the table, they reflect what you actually want them to do according to the rules. One subtlety I learned after several different war games uh, I've played is that different games prefer different kinds of bases. Some miniatures come with the bases already attached, but I think most commonly you're going to find miniatures that come without a base and you're expected to glue them onto a base yourself. And there are several kinds of bases. There are round bases, there are square bases, there are even hex bases, and then there are big bases that hold lots and lots of soldiers on them. Some games expect your troops to stay together in formation, so you would want to glue, probably, your soldiers onto a big base that represents exactly one squad, or one portion of that squad. Whereas other games assume that your miniatures are going to be sort of independent of one another, there might be rules around how far they can wander away from each other and still maintain unit coherency, but the ability to not be together does exist, and that's part of the gameplay. And it, they may require circle bases instead of square bases, or square bases and not circle bases uh, for facing rules and so on. Luckily, 
There are really, really useful trays so that you can take miniatures that you have based separately, place them into these miniature trays, and treat them as as if though they were on one large base. So even if you are playing a rank and flank kind of game where you have troops that can literally never separate from one another, you can do that with these movement trays. I do that for my Imperial Roman army because in some games, like in Broken Legions, they move independent of one another, while in in other games that I use them in, they are required to stay in legion formation. Step five is paint. Yeah, you have to paint your miniatures. Never play with unpainted miniatures. It's embarrassing. It's boring. Paint your miniatures. You've already done your research. You know what they should look like, so just go for it. Paint them all. Make it look as pretty as you want them to look. I wouldn't belabor this myself. Some people do. Some people only paint and never play. For me, I get them painted good enough so that they look really cool at an arm's length down on the tabletop. It's kind of a bummer when you take up close when you take close up photography of them and you you can totally see the breaks in your paints and the 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 places where you've overlapped and the places that you haven't highlighted and all that other stuff. But you know what? It's worth it. I would rather paint rather quickly and get back to playing than spend all my time painting and never getting around to actually playing with them. And that's it. The final step, the unlisted sixth step, is to play your game. Take your miniatures that you've researched and built and painted and put them on a table and start rolling dice. This is why you're doing this. This is the war game. It amuses me constantly to think of just how much work wargaming actually is. What amazes me is that I fell into it without giving it a second thought. And it's only after a year of gaming that I truly understand why wargaming is a hobby all its own. I guess the total and constant immersion is kind of what appeals to me and probably a lot of wargamers. I mean, when you have to develop a workflow for the part of the game that happens before the game starts, it's probably a good sign that you're a lifestyle gamer. I hope this has somewhat uh, demystified the process of miniature wargaming, if that was something that you were unclear about. And if, if you already knew all this stuff, then hopefully this has given you insight into how somebody else does the thing that you do which is, I think, always kind of interesting to hear about. Have fun. Thanks for watching.